We want to thank everyone for joining us today and for taking the time to spend the next hour with us. We know how precious time is, so we really appreciate it. Uh, we also want to thank the folks uh, joining us from our global um, meetup groups. We have a meetup group in London, one in Berlin and one in Dubai as well from our global community of practice, so welcome. Um, yes, if you are joining right now, please feel free to write in the chat window, where are you coming from, the city and the country. We are streaming from Berlin, although you cannot see just the fire. <laughs> we started the fire. It's not so cold, but we was thought like, hmm, let's warm up. It's the... a fireside chat. It's a fireside chat, so let's represent it well. Uh, now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time and you don't know us, we are Dana and John. We are co-founders of the Design Sprint Academy. We are a consultancy firm dedicated to help teams and organizations to define and solve their biggest business challenges through problem framing and design sprints. No surprise there. Now for the, five, for the last five years, we've been working with uh, the world's biggest brands and help them build and scale their innovation capabilities throughout our tra training programs, also throughout workshop facilitation. And we are so excited now to share with you today how, problem, how the problem framing uh, method that we've developed is used in practice by our clients and friends at which. Um, and to give you like a quick roadmap of today's session, we're going to have a fireside chat with Rick Lipiet, uh, head of design at which, and Drew Shepard, uh, user experience design lead, and basically dive deep into what it means to invest time in upfront to frame a problem and also how problem framing has turned into a go-to process for stakeholder alignment and decision making at which. Now, before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. This session will be recorded, so no worries. You're going to be able to review it later if you still want to refresh your memory. Also, free use to, uh, free, feel free to use the Q&A section in the chat to add your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them through, throughout the Thanks webinar. Uh, and also, this webinar will be uh, one hour long, finishing around 7 p.m. on Central European time. So thank you again for joining us. And I think it's time to, uh, for you to meet our guests today. And I'm going, to, I'm going to ask them to quickly introduce themselves. And uh, maybe Rick, we can start with you. Uh, please tell us what's your role at which and what goal are you trying to achieve within that role so that we have like a bet better picture <laughs> of who oh. you are. I'll just say quickly, in case people are not sure what or who which are, we are a UK-based UK uh, consumer association, so the UK's consumer champion. We are actually a charity, and you know our goal is to make um, consumers' lives simpler, fairer, and safer. Um, we have members, and it is a paid-for subscription, so we do an awful lot of... Um, kind of reviews uh, around products uh, and uh, safety issues and things like that. So we've got a product, if you like, which is our core, which is around reviews. But we also do a lot of pro bono work around consumer rights and campaigning and things like that. So my role is of, of head of UX design and research. Um, I've got a team of about 15. Um, what we are focused on doing is really center of product excellence if you like we we want to be a product-led uh, organization uh, mainly obviously around our digital products but actually that goes a little bit wider than that as well um, so elements of service design we have call centers and things like that too um, and my interest in this was really to do with kind of some of those bigger strategic initiatives that we needed to kind of step back from and take a really wide view of but I have got quite involved with some of the more granular pieces as well. They tend to be more program based. So one of them I might mention is a design system so that we've got some more coherence and consistency across that. Um, Drew is in my team. I will let him speak, though, so he can tell you a bit more about what he does. He's a lot closer to the kind of doing the uh, problem framing and um, product led things in practice, whereas I kind of have a bit step back usually. But we'll get into that later. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, thanks. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Drew. Uh, I'm the lead user experience designer. Uh, yeah, in Rick's team. Um, and as you said, I'm kind of, I guess, closer to problem framing, closer to actually doing, doing, I suppose, than, than more in that kind of strategic area. But um, I tend to work, I suppose, in the sort of the initial two diamond, on the initial diamond, I guess, of the double diamond approach. 
Um, so the discover and define areas. Um, so I'm kind of responsible for making sure that we've got all of the tools that we can uh, that we can that we can get to make sure that when we're using um, that, that kind of design methodology, that we are really looking at real problems that real people have. Um, and that's kind of, you know, it's one of our principles um, when we're designing is that, you know, we shouldn't be doing anything for, for people, you know, shouldn't be doing anything that doesn't exist as a problem. Um, and one of the easiest ways that we found of making sure that we're doing that is, is using problem framing um, so that we kind of, you know, we, we take a load of, of, of inputs um, and then and, and then sort of go through them, filter them down to make sure that we can kind of come up with something that is going to have impact. Um, and I think, you know, really, I would say, you know, impact is probably the key thing that problem framing has sort of done for us. Um, and it's allowed us where we've had initiatives to uh, to understand, I guess, where we can make more impact. Um, and then we can kind of uh, be better at, I suppose, getting get better at doing things for people when they need them. Uh, where they need them and, and how they need them. Um, and I guess, yeah, so that probably describes, I guess, the majority of the stuff that I do around problem framing. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I know, I know we met in 2019 when we came in to run a corporate training at which um, and we, we taught their um, design sprints and problem framing. And of course, as you mentioned, you were looking at problems even before that. Maybe you can tell us more, how did you get into that? How did you get into problem framing? What triggered it? Yeah, if I take that one, I just, we, we've been looking at Google design sprints for, for some time and then design thinking actually as a methodology. And we had you know, several methodologies that we were using within our, we didn't have squads at the time, but within our product teams. And we we did start actually sort of a couple of years before we met you guys and, and, and did a prospective problem framing. As Drew was reminding me, I was actually in that, uh, but I, I didn't remember all the details of it, to be fair. But we were doing it around our trusted trader um, kind of service, which is an endorsement. So, so it's quite a lot of service design. And we want to take a step back from it. And we tried it out. And that was, you know, that, that seemed to be quite effective, but we were kind of, you know, we were busking it, to be honest. Um, and then about a year later, we actually tried to do um, a, a kind of a more campaign based. Uh, we, we always have Black Friday comes up and that's obviously a big day for people buying things in across Europe, actually. And um, but particularly in the UK. And it's a big day for us because we get lots of people kind of um, signing up for our subscription and things like that. And we wanted to sort of run a proper five day design sprint. And we realized we did. It will lose you. I think we lost to Rick. Rick was telling us about some people working on uh, on the street, like drilling holes. So I'm hoping that <laughs> it's not happening right now. <laughs> so Drew, maybe yeah, I can. I guess I can probably pick up a little bit on on, on what was going, what sort of Rick was touching on, I suppose. Um, yeah, so as you said, we, we started off kind of doing it kind of um, on the fly, I suppose, just kind of trying to work out how we could how we could start to to improve the things that we were doing and, and, and make a better impact um, using some kind of problem framing or sort of design sprint kind of activity. Um, but then we realized that, you know, there, there was a big project that we were working on um, and we really needed to kind of have some help with that. Um, and I think that's probably where where we came across um, Design Sprint Academy and started to kind of get in contact with you. Um, and then we've had, I think we've had probably three lots of training, I think that we've done with you, but the initial one was probably the biggest one, um, which was in person as well, actually, I think the other two have been remote. Um, and that was, I guess, well, I'm not entirely sure when it was, 2019, was it maybe, or 20, yeah, yeah, 2019? Yeah. 2019, yeah. And and that was, you know, that, that I suppose for, for us, that was really the beginning um, of really starting to understand exactly how this stuff really could work for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had the, the the design sprint training, we had the facilitation training, um, and then we had problem framing kind of within that. Um, and I guess once we'd done that training, we found ourselves uh, in a situation where we could see opportunities for design sprints, but actually problem framing was presenting itself as being one of the better things that we could we could offer people when they were coming to us. I think we were we were in a, in a position where we had lots of lots of things coming towards us. Um, and needed a way of, um, I suppose, of filtering them and pushing back and saying, you know, rather than coming to us with solutions, can we help you to kind of work through your problem a bit more? Um, who's coming, uh, Drew, so who's coming your way? Uh, is this the business or what kind of requests were you getting? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, yeah, it's the business. So different different areas of the business, you know, kept coming to us with their kind of initiatives um, that they, they've been working up in their, 
you know, working against their own objectives and saying, you know, we, we think we want this. Um, can you do this for us? Um, or, or, you know, just, just putting together kind of um, roadmaps, I suppose, where there would be sort of a set of features that needed to be delivered. Um, and I guess it, it was our kind of attempt and, and, and chance really to, to, to say, actually, can we think about this a bit more? You know, can we spend some, some time understanding if this really is the right area that we should be, um, should be focusing on? Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it worked really well because um, I guess, I, I guess for, for me, it, it worked really well because we were able to start changing, I guess, the way that people started looking at, um, at, at the way they work with us, I suppose, and, and the way that we work with them. Um, we could offer them something that could really help with focus, uh, something that could really help with alignment um, and, and really positively something that could really help with innovation. Um, so I think, you know, when we were talking about, you know, about focus, um, as I said, um, people coming to us and asking us to do things, you know, which is a, a massive research organization. So, you know, in reality, there's probably not many consumer issues that which doesn't know about. You know, that's that's what the organization is all about. Um, but the, the big problem is that, um, you know, knowing where to look or, or which things to focus on is, is really difficult because mm-hmm. you don't know how you're going to make the biggest impact. So problem framing has really helped us to focus on those because we've been able to kind of go through the problem framing process um, and and very easily, you know, in that discovery process, in that discovery kind of phase, say, well, maybe this isn't the things we're working on or maybe we can pivot and work on something else, you know, to really build the impact um, without spending too much cash. You know, it's a, it's a really you know, important thing to be able to do. Um, and I guess, you know, alignment too, it's been really useful to be able to take people, you know, stakeholders on a, on a longer journey from the beginning through to, you know, the, the kind of problem, I suppose from problem framing beginning through to the problem statement, um, having those people involved in those areas really gets them to understand where they could be doing things, what they could be doing, um, and really helps to kind of get um, get alignment, so get alignment. Um, so they know at the end why we're doing what we're doing and their support, you know, they really get their buy-in from that from that happening. Um, and and in, in terms of innovation, um, you know, problem framing really helps us to, um, to in the sessions, I think, really to kind of interrogate what we think we're doing, mm-hmm. um, look at new angles, you know, look at whether the audience that we think we're trying to solve, solve this problem for actually is the audience that we need to be solving it for. Um, I mean, an example of that is that we did, we've done some work around scams. Um, I'm, obviously, we did quite a lot of work around scams. And one of the things we were looking at was, you know, is how, how could we become um, like a preeminent kind of um, a preeminent uh, recognized organization that could help people with scams. Uh, and when we were looking at that, what we were mainly thinking about at the beginning, when we were coming through looking at kind of, you know, what are we doing at the moment? Where are we, where are we in that space now? Um, what we were doing then, in the majority of that was um, looking at people who were potential victims of scams. Now, potential victims of scams is everybody. <laughs> um, and, and that's a huge, huge audience. Um, so through the problem framing, we were able to, to focus on, to focus down to victims of scams. It's a much smaller group. But also as kind of offshoots, we also thought about, um, you know, scammers. Scammers are impossible to track down. You know, it's impossible to target them. But we can target with uh, the help of other organizations, you know, partnerships with government or with, you know, with platforms, the people who actually enable them. So if we're talking about, you know, email scams, they have to come to you through via a provider. What what things can be done with them in order to kind of prevent that from happening? So yeah, it's, it's helped us to kind of innovate in that way. And you know, like to I suppose to look at, as I said, a, a different angle by by considering the you know, context constraints and, and different audiences to see how it can become more powerful and more impactful. So for sure it helped you with impact when it comes with to the to having more focus to, to innovating better and to have this alignment between the stakeholders. But in what other contexts have you used problem framing? Maybe Ricky, you can expand on that. that <laughs> Sorry, that just kind of died on me. I, I assume you busked over that, but um, yes, uh, I don't know where I, I cut out, but yes, after we we kind of connected and, and went through some training, it became really clear to us that um, design sprints are really kind of quite squad focused, really for us and product teams, and actually getting people five days back to back in in you know kind of committing to that was always going to be quite tricky, and it, and and also the sort of Problem framing was a slightly less prescriptive, and we we thought this is going to be really useful across the business, actually. And we 
thought if we've we've stretched it a little bit when actually still three days back to back is a little bit tricky but actually as long as we don't leave too big a gap we can kind of split that out a little bit um, and work around with some of our more senior stakeholders to really reframe some of you know the, the big problems that we kind of look at so we've used it really across the board actually uh, it, you know it's been really useful I, I think we all kind of had a bit of an epiphany and went man we need to do this on here here and here and once we've done a couple of them and then people had heard that hey that's gone really well gets people's buying gets people aligned gets people focused gets people to innovate all the things that Drew's just talked about um we thought that this is you know we can do this across the board so we, we've used them on OKR settings for squads and, and but also for the business actually sort of like our annual OKRs We've used them a big product vision kind of pieces where, you know, looking at a three year plan for our kind of like buy smart initiative, you know, that was you know quite a significant piece of work. And again, we just didn't want to get it wrong when it's you need, you know, had a reasonable budget and quite a lot of a focus on it from senior stakeholders. So we needed to get everyone aligned and make sure we were doing the right thing. And Rick, um, um, you mentioned you mentioned that you mostly have senior stakeholders in these sessions and you're really running them across the business. I have a question related to that. Like as you started doing these sessions, did you have any sort of pushback from them? Like why do we need to be in these sessions? Or what are we getting? Like how did you start engaging them? Well, other than the time commitment, which was, you're kidding me, three days, uh, that, that was that was one of the issues. But no, not really. It, it was more the other way around, actually, is that I, I, I kind of alluded to it before, is that we, we had to work out to get the right people in there. And what this big product vision piece we did for BuySmart, you know, we could have had 50 people in there. We know that's not right. I think we got it down to about 12, which is still not optimal, which is, but we, 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 that's why we ended up with two facilitators in there. But I still cut some people out and I kind of, you know, one of my learnings from that was actually I could have gone with a few more people who were very senior, but just get them in right at the beginning so they can kind of see what the, you know, kind of what's going on and then let them naturally either step back or more usefully give you a proxy or a delegate to do that. But yeah, we tried to get it to the, you know, the eight, but yeah, that was on some of these, that's not going to happen. So we kind of had to widen the shoulders. And in that particular session, we, we knew there would be very opinionated people in the, in the workshop itself. Um, and so we had two facilitators for that. Neither of which was me, by the way, because I, be <laughs> I needed to be in it to kind of steer it a little bit. And, and that was a, quite a complex one. But we've used them for, say, Drew's been talking about the, the scams and you know, kind of impact areas. We've used them ourselves for getting our product experience principles that he alluded to in there as well. Um, and I've used them for a kind of program kickoff, you know, just to get everyone on the same page, which was, you know, kind of a squad, get the leads aligned and a few kind of stakeholders and we just came out, the how might we was really a mission statement there, was that how might we build better products faster that click with our consumers. We just chopped the HMW off the front, and then we had our kind of mission statement, and off we went. Right. right. So you, you touched a little bit on what happens in a design, I mean, you know, in a problem framing that it takes around three days that you involve mm -hmm. stakeholders. Um, I wanted to get more tactical, and maybe, uh, Drew, maybe you can help us out and explain a little bit about what actually happens in a problem framing workshops. What are the main phases or the steps that you need to go through? Sure, yeah, um, I guess it's been, a, it's been an evolution. Um, we started off, I suppose, with, with what we'd learned and then, um, and then with you, we built kind of built on that. You know, I, I, think I did a talk before where we spoke about the problems that you can encounter in, in problem framing and, and you really helped, I suppose, to, to, to help, help to kind of make it better for us to begin. I think that was probably one of the most difficult things we had. And so, so what we begin with is with a um, is a problem framing brief. So we send a problem framing brief out to uh, all of the people who are going to be participating. Um, and that asks people to try and get, un essentially to get under the hood of the problem or the problem space, I suppose, really, from, from the perspective of the customer and also from the business. So we, we get them to ask a, a whole bunch of questions about you know, things like what challenges are we facing, um, what things have we already tried, how successful were they, what barriers have we seen, um, what would look like, uh, what would success look like for the uh, for the customer, things like that. And we bring that all together um, and, and we spend some time, you know, kind of collating that and bringing that into 
what essentially now is always into a Miro board um, so that people can kind of get a really good idea of, I suppose, the, where the problems are, challenges are across the board from the different people who are represented within the problem framing um, session. Um, and then we also get a kind of experts, you know, we, we, we did with you lightning talks, you know, we get experts in. So people, the researchers generally, who've got really good information to share or anyone who's got anything within the group who, who, can share something that gives real insight into something that's that's really kind of going in going on um to kind of understand the and problem so, it's always part of your groundwork what it is doing. yeah so there's yeah so there's those two things which happen first um and then when we're in the sessions um i guess yeah i mean i think three days in person um we do a lot more now that probably take less time or they take more time but over more days so it's it's really a lot of it's about organizing kind of diaries really to try and work out when people can be there to do the things that are needed um but when we're actually in the session so we're always really clear you know there's an agenda at the beginning of the session um we always have kind of an introduction we always have to ha always have a kind of you know an, an intro to Miro so people to kind of understand how to use the tools um and also you know a, a kind of an icebreaker just to kind of get everybody warmed up and ready um, and then once once we're kind of properly into the session, there's a kind of um, uh, an exercise about why we're doing problem framing, um, an example of something that that really gets to the heart of what happens. Um, I can't remember if it's an example that you gave us, but it's about an MRI scanner. Um, oh yeah, yeah, the Nagdit uh, uh, story. story, yes. Yeah, so it, yeah, which is you know, and, it, and it's a good one because it's a real you know emotional hard hitter about you know the, the guy who 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 designs what he thinks is the perfect MRI scanning experience and then sees a kid go through it and realizes that he's created something that instills fear and terror in them yeah. and that he really needs to understand how to change that. So that really you know really always gets across the aim of I suppose a problem frame of what it needs to do. Um, and then once we've done that, then we go into the lightning talk. So we get people to kind of, as I said, the, the experts, I suppose, really to talk about things. Everybody makes notes, put those notes together um, and then come up with really what are the problems. Um, so we get all those on post-it notes um, and then we get people to map them. So we get, you know, kind of can we theme them? Um, are there any problem, you know, problems that are similar, that kind of stuff? And, and then we vote on them to, to work out, you know, which are the problems that we think are um, the priorities for for the group, um, and in that role, I think um, with Rick said earlier, with the sort of senior stakeholders, we always have um, a decider, so the, the stakeholder who's yeah. essentially closest to or more most responsible for the project gets to really guide the direction of what happens with the awareness of of the things that are coming out of the of the session. Um, and once we've once we've kind of we've done that, we kind of prioritize. Um, those problems, and then we turn them into how might we's. Uh, so that's the kind of initial stage. Um, and then there's sometimes a split kind of now at that point, and then there'll be another session later. But if it was going to carry on, we then implement um, a frame the problem activity, which is um, it's an IDEO uh, based activity. It's called frame the, frame the design challenge. And what we do with that is we take the how might we, um, and then we just run it really, it's running it through a set of filters just by asking questions. Um, things like what's the ultimate impact you're actually trying to have? Um, what um, you know? What what are some context and constraints that you might have? You know, from for us, it's at which. You know, what are the constraints that we have? What's the context that we might need? Um, and and who are the audiences uh, that you're trying to that you're you're trying to do solve this problem for? Um, and then that enables us, as I said earlier on, to kind of, in some cases, switch around excuse me, switch around uh, and innovate on that problem so that we can come out with a better how might we at the end, uh, which we can then turn into a problem statement. Um, and then we finalize that problem statement and that becomes kind of the deliverable, I guess, for the next stage. So um, true, basically you're starting with, with the business uh, outlook, with the business perspective, you're defining opportunities at this level and then you're reframing it by introducing the customer perspective and thinking of other audiences until you get to maybe a different uh, problem statement or a more refined yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And being such a collaborative process, I guess it involves a lot of critical thinking because with all the questions that you ask, you just, we are looking for like gaps or the things that are not obvious or people are not aware of from the beginning. Um, now thinking about the process itself, I know that you drew play a lot the role of a facilitator in such in such a workshop. And Rick, you kind of mix between <laughs> them. Sometimes you're the decider, sometimes you're the facilitator. How the does troublemaker. The troublemaker. <laughs> How does that look like? 
Um, it's quite interesting, really. I mean, if I'm honest, I haven't I, I, I haven't done um, a facilitation for a while because normally I kind of take a bit of I'm actually more involved in the step back from it and go right. Should I be in this at all? And very rarely is that I should be in as a facilitator. So it's usually like helping someone set it up and go right. Okay, we need to do this. I think you should do it this way. We definitely look at the stakeholder mapping and work out who's got the most influence, who needs to be in there, who's got the expert knowledge. And then we usually decide on who that decider uh, should be, um, you know, kind of and then work with them and, you know, kind of set up the session. So usually I'm taking a role in, in, in that. And then I usually go, guys, you get on with it. Unless, unless I have to be in it, then because I'm a control freak, I would like to be the decider most of the time. It doesn't Rick, always work out. Rick, uh, Rick I'm going to, um, this is a really good segue into this question. Like we just got one question into the chat and it's related to what you're speaking. And it says, um, I have struggled to understand how to use the decider. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose of having the group vote democratically? How do you navigate if the crowd vote is different from the decider? So. And given like in problem framing, a lot of time you have senior decision makers, why do you still need a decider? And uh, what happens if, let's say, the rest of the group go against? against? Um, we haven't had that happen because we have A, excellent facilitators uh, like <laughs> Drew and Co. And B, in the ones that are more sticky, me or one of my uh, kind of guiding a little bit and actually if you've got your decision but maybe this sounds a bit kind of trite but if you've got your decision maker right and you've done a lot of prep work with them mm -hmm. you shouldn't get to that point i i is it, is how i would would look at it i when we've done it we basically do the dot voting yes you can put your dot on something completely different but usually the weight of a the, what that's the whole beauty of these the alignment of a couple of days yeah. It makes it quite difficult to go against that and go, do you know what? You're all a bunch of whatevers. We're gonna, I'm gonna go over here and just completely go against you. That is unlikely to happen, I I I feel. And therefore, what happens is when you've more useful is you've got this, and then this does happen a lot. You've got this, this, and this, and they've all got the same number of dots on them, and you're like, someone needs to take a punt on this. And then again, if you've done your 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 job properly in the setup, the decider will have that kind of insight and take a bit of a gut feel. That that's how I feel. I drew, I don't know if you want to add to that. Uh, I think I think you're right. I think it's it's the deciders for me that the role of the decider is more about deciding between those kind of top three that usually have, as Rick said, the similar amount of votes. Um, you know, I think you know it we're all generally working towards the same goal. So there's not really much ever that's particularly left field that comes out. Um, and, 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 and because of that, it's, yeah, the decider is more about um, just, I suppose, a, a fine tuning of like which of these in their minds hits more of the objectives or the key results that we're looking for ra rather than the others. So, yeah. So yeah, I've not, I've not been in as much, I've not been in a session where we've had a, you know, a sort of a set two between somebody saying, no, we're definitely doing this. It's only got, it's got no votes, but we're doing it. Um, it's always been that kind of a, a fair share and just kind of the direction around which we should go for. And that's, uh, and I could add to that, that's been our experience as well. We've never run into a situation where the group was completely against the decider. I think the process leads to this uh, sort of alignment. And, um, and I think you need a decider in many of these instances because these are the people who are responsible for what happens afterwards. So it's, uh, it's not... Someone you, I don't know, spin the wheel of fortune and you decide like, hey, you should be a decider, but it's actually someone who needs to move forward the project or an initiative or something along the lines. Or in the end, take accountability yeah. for what someone happens. Someone who's accountable, yeah, I would say that's, that's the right word, accountability. Yeah. So after you facilitate the problem framing workshop, what are some, what happens next? What are some typical steps that follow? If you can think of a project or put it in a context, uh, Rick, I don't know if you want to take this one, I guess, because I think my response to this is probably going to be more about what happens when it goes wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you can kind of go with the, what happens when it goes well to begin with. I mean, it, it, a number of things. It depends on the problem space, to be honest, that you've been working on. And like I say, one of the, the one I, the example I just alluded to previously was actually we just needed to align the team. We knew the team was going to be set up, but we wanted to make sure everyone was fully aligned with the problem we were solving. And that became kind of like the mission statement. And then they just went on into, you know, kind of setting up that squad as an ongoing program. They did design sprints within that. 
that's one track. Another track was, as I mentioned, that the one with the, <laughs> the two facilitators, three How Might Wees and, and a lot of, lot of senior stakeholders. I kind of knew we would come out with more than one How Might We. And that, so that was interesting. And the decider there is actually there was quite a few. And we, I kind of went, yeah, I think we're going to have to allow more than one. And what they kicked off was um, we knew that we would need some further research, that these were really, really interesting problems, but we felt that we didn't have enough insight into them. So we, what that kicked off was some tracks of quite significant, um, some of it external, some of it market research, some of it audience research that then ended up feeding into either a program or directly into a squad. Actually, one of them went into a squad. One of them has gone into a kind of business proposition. Another one's actually become a, a value of that we, we're working around sustainability. So there's quite a lot of different um, outcomes. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 Drew, you might want to just put in the ones that didn't maybe don't always go right and then I'll come back to kind yeah. of like how we try. I, I'm, I'm quite curious yeah. like what uh, what does it mean when problem framing goes wrong so I suppose it's not wrong <laughs> it's not that it's not I guess it's not that the problem framing goes wrong I suppose it's probably that the problem framing happens um and the impact of the problem framing changes something within what's meant to happen next so it, typically I guess it, as, as Rick was saying in that kind of squad model in the product model that we have it, it, we know why we're doing the problem framing. We know what's happening next. We've got stakeholders. We've got a squad. Everything kind of runs through, and and then we move into kind of you know the the, the develop and deliver phase of of, of the design process. Um, but sometimes when we've been asked to help out, we've been asked to help out because people are struggling with a problem, and we get them to a kind of a clear definition of the problem, and there is stakeholder support, but there isn't necessarily something to do next. It's kind of oh well, now we've got a better idea of what our problem is. Um, that's really great, but we're not going to do anything with it. Um, but I think the, the thing that's really important in those, those at those times is that it's not necessarily it's not a failure of problem framing. It's not that it's gone wrong. It's that it's occurred um, and it's changed the way that people kind of perceive what they were doing and they need some time to adjust to that. So they're not quite ready to take that problem statement on and do something with it. But it, it sort of sits there and, and enables them to kind of um, to I suppose to feel differently and to to, a bit, to feel like they've innovated. I think um, you know they've they've changed the way that they've been thinking about a problem. Um, they've got a foundation for for innovation, um, but it's going to take a little bit longer for them to get around to actually dealing with that issue because maybe all of the work that they've been doing previously and all of their initiatives are not based around tackling the problem in that way or tackling that specific problem. But it enables them to kind of I suppose go back and say, well, actually we've done some work here. And this has made us really think about whether we're actually doing the right thing. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it for me, again, it, it, it's really important because it happens up front. It happens before you've invested in, you know, getting a third party into the deal development or any of that kind of stuff. Before you've started writing any of those specs or anything like that. Um, and, and it enables people to kind of quickly say, actually, let's halt on this. Maybe we need to do some more research. Maybe we need to change our minds on what we're doing but it's not going to cost a vast amount of money um, and it's not going to be a huge amount of disruption. Uh, and, and, you know, and because you've got that alignment through the stake, through the process with the stakeholders, they're behind whatever happens next, whether it is great, let's work on it or hold on. This has actually made a fundamental shift in the way that we were approaching this. Uh, we need some time to think about it. Um, and I think, you know, for, for me that the example I have of that is I was work, doing some work on impact areas um, and that was a couple of years ago now. Um, and, and it did really get to that point where there are, I think, 82 things that, want, that, that people wanted to happen um, and they needed to be prioritised. And we did the problem framing and it took every group through the problem framing in the same way. And they came to the end and, and they realised that, you know, that they, weren't, they didn't want to carry on doing this kind of feature-led kind of roadmap. That actually, they wanted to do is to say, well, where's the impact? Where can we do these things? What do we need to do next? Um, and it changed, it changed that, changed the format of how that was working, but didn't result in the problem, the problem statement being taken to create a solution immediately afterwards. Good. Yeah, the good thing on that is that we didn't go and solve the wrong problems. That's, 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 that's the, the value that even when it does kind of hit that kind of we need to step back from it, it means you didn't go off and, as Drew says, invest in, in something that was probably the wrong thing to do. Exactly. It's like a painful win. <laughs> A painful win. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, good for us. Yeah, <laughs> it's good for you long term. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think most people see that, and and you know, I kind of 
I feel that, that there is, we haven't had too much pushback about, about, you know, the things that come out there. What we have had to deal with is that's going to be really tricky for us right now. Hang on, we need to park that or actually we need to go and look at something else uh, and maybe do another problem framing session. So Can I, can I ask one more technical question since because uh, someone posted something that we're, uh, that something that we really um, love when it comes about problem framing. And here's the question that we got, uh, Drew, uh, very tactical, very practical. So how do you make sure that you integrate enough user research to keep it grounded in evidence, not just on the room's assumptions? <laughs> I guess that, I suppose that that's um, really, I suppose that's what the lightning talks are for. Um, but also that groundwork that we spoke about earlier on, you know, making sure you get the, get the context and so make sure that context is based in the research. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and I think, you know, those are the opportunities that we have to make sure that we get that research in there and then we get the user's perspective. Um, and as you know, me as a, a user experience designer, you know, that's my, my role to make sure that the user is championed and, and the other one, other people who are in the, um, in the, problem framing sessions you know who have that role that's kind of what what we're there to do as well um but yeah i think that's kind of you know that those are the two the two main ways that we get them in there but but also we'll we do find sometimes that one of the how might weeds might actually be uh, the result of that might be some more research and it might be that we don't know enough about this right now um or we think as a you know the business has and we agree that this is where the business should be working but we don't know whether that's actually going to be the right place. Um, so sometimes, you know, we take research in, we might do kind of, you know, some, I guess, some research beforehand around the, the different areas. So we, we, you know, we might have, um, we might speak with some people who we think are the audience uh, and get their kind of their, their views on things. Um, but we may find as we go through this, the process that that might change. So there's always a chance at the end to kind of regroup and say, well, do we know enough now about this new problem? Um, so should we do some more research? Uh, so yeah, it's you know it's it's a balancing act, I suppose. You know, you, we can't go in. Sometimes you can't go in with no research. Um, that would be you know completely the wrong thing to do, and it has to be grounded in that. Um, but there is always the opportunity through what you create to to realise that there is maybe the opportunity for more research to help you to to, to drive. I guess as you said, the, the user side of the argument when you move into um, the next stage of the design process. I mean, I mean, we always at Design Sprint Academy, we champion for bringing this user uh, research insights into decision-making process. So it's grounded in, in evidence. But then I think one of the main benefits of problem framing, and I think Rick mentioned that as well, is it's uncovering gaps in your knowledge. And as soon as you have a group of senior stakeholders all aligned, we actually don't know these things. So we need to do something about it. So I think that's, uh, that's a big win as, uh, as well. Yeah, I definitely echo that with the, the the thing that I was telling you about earlier. With the, we went into the problem framing this this the the, the, the bigger kind of more strategic with this huge monolithic. It's still there actually on our third floor because we kind of did it just for lockdown. It's like five foot high and about fifteen, maybe even twenty foot long, with all this kind of journey mapping and all the insight we had. We collated all the insight we had on the buying journeys to, to take it into this buy smart piece of work. And you thought, well, there's an awful lot of, you know, research inside there. And we did lightning talks on top. And then we came out with, hey, we've got these three things. We actually need to know a bit more about them. So, <laughs> you know, that was kind of like research in, research out. And it was, you know, big, but we got everyone's buy-in and everyone understood that actually we didn't have enough about our sustainability of that we didn't join the dots up on our kind of, you know, home, if you like, um, renovation of home and uh, augmenting your home life and joining it with Trusted Trader. And we still actually would want more insight onto how people were trying to get the thing as quickly as possible. We didn't have a speedy thing. So we came out with three of those and then they became programs themselves and, and fed into the squad. So yeah, research in, research out in that particular thing, but then it did translate into these programs of work. Exactly, I think that customer research is one of the things, the most powerful thing that on one side builds this empathy and on the other side creates this alignment between teams. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, that helps a lot with, with having everyone on track and following the same direction. Now, I want to ask you, you've done problem framing with, in different scenarios for different teams in different departments. How, how does the rest of the company learn about it? How do they learn that you are doing this mm -hmm. and maybe they need it also? 
<laughs> we didn't have a problem with that, I have to say. It was, like, it was actually holding them off. Hang on, wait a minute. It's like as soon as we kind of literally run a couple and, and, and we're not a massive company, so there's probably, someone correct me if I'm wrong, three, four hundred, we're about 800 people, but, but, but there was 400 or so in the building. And we always did our um, sessions in quite uh, you know, either glass uh, fronted um, rooms or even open spaces. What are they up to? That looks good. That was interesting. And like I say, this monolithic thing, it's still there. Everyone was like, what's that? I want to have it. So, and we would take people through. So actually from board and council, we were taking people through on the kind of like, just because it was quite visible. Um, so we had the opposite problem really is it very quickly got this kind of right. Well, hang on a minute. I've heard about this. I think I want one. And so we actually had to do, and Drew will probably add some color to this. We had had some people didn't need problem framing. They were just kind of jumping on there. Well, I've heard about this and I kind of want it. It was like, well, actually that's something else that you probably need to do first um but yeah we we it, it grew pretty quickly i have to say once we'd done the first two big we did one around the mobile app which was quite discreet more of a design sprint and that sort of got most of the products and tech team to like yep we need to do this more often and, and as much mm -hmm. as possible then we did this big strategic one and like i say it was actually i, I kicked myself there was a few people i left out because that kind of did potentially give me some problems later um but yeah that was it everyone wants one so i don't drew do you, you've had to do more of the kind of triage of these haven't you i guess so yeah i mean the, the first four problem framing ones that um sessions that i ran i, I was mentioned earlier was about there was a kind of when we were looking at impact areas and, and that was kind of was a domino effect is i was asked to help out so there were four four groups of people wanting to do something and it didn't make sense for only one of them to do the problem framing. It made sense for all four of them to do it. So they all came out in the same, with the same outputs at the end. Um, and, and that went, you know, that was across, it, it wasn't so much really on the um, the product side of the business, really, or the commercial side of the business, it was actually on the advocacy side of the business. Um, so it, it really helped to get the buy-in from that side of things. You know, the, the, the director of advocacy was really, really interested in what we were doing um and and had you know fantastic words to say about about the outcomes that we had and the way that it really enabled us to start um yeah to, to i suppose it enabled us to kind of really get a head start on the okrs really on those objectives by understanding really where the where the impact could be done uh via the, the problem framing um and then i think um i suppose i've done somewhere i suppose where we've pushed it where we've said you know been in a process something's been going on um and realised that maybe maybe this would be more productive, more efficient if some problem framing was done because maybe there's a bit of vagueness around what's happening, or mm -hmm. maybe as you know as you mentioned, there's, there's gaps in knowledge. Um, but how do we define what that knowledge is, or how do we define what gaps there are? Um, and what we've suggested, you know, myself and one of the other leads, we were in some sessions together, and it, it wasn't um, um, related to product. It was actually around our diversity and inclusion. Um, activities uh, and we said you know we, we really think that it would benefit from having some problem framing done because we seem to have a lot of information about what we think the problems are um, and we're a group you know of, of of people who have different backgrounds but we don't know about the entire organization so it would be good to understand where those problems exist for people so that when we do come up with initiatives to run for dni that we actually make sure we're targeting the people that need it most um, and, and it, you know, it, it really, you know, it, it, it helped. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you can. Yeah. Um, no, I, I wanted to. I mean, we I, we have a couple of yeah. uh, questions uh, here which I want to ask, but related to this, because you're running problem framing sessions. Before I ask uh, the questions that I got from from the audience, I want to ask you who's who's facilitating this uh, this problem framing sessions. Like clearly, you Rick made it uh, quite clear that uh, Drew is uh, running a lot of this, but. Um, yeah, is there like because you said like there's lots of requests coming your way and you actually need to to push it back. Do you have like a team doing this or? Um, yeah, so I mean everybody who's done the training with you is kind of able to do the the problem framing sessions, um, but we find typically that the people who are available to do them um, and can put themselves forward for them are the people who are in the team in the user experience. Mm -hmm. team on the UX design team um so typically we are kind of I guess uh at the forefront of that you know that the user researchers are kind of doing them too um so I guess it's it's people 
who have a sort of a, a vested interest, I guess, in it being the user and real people uh, and real problems who are kind of the ones that are running them. Um, and, and we kind of, you know, we, we we talk about, you know, facilitation, we share things, we try to work out, you know, what's what's going on, who can do what, um, and, and, and try to take people on the journey. Um, and, we, and we do try to try, we try to do it kind of with two facilitators, because especially online, we found that, you need somebody running the facilitation and somebody sitting just yeah. picking up all of the other things that are going on. <laughs> you know, you just you just can't, it's not physically possible to do both to do that role and to do the other role at the same time. So I guess it's, you know, we, we found that, you know, typically two people uh, most of the time from the, the UXDR team. Um, and, you know, we're really trying to grow the network and get more people involved. Um, but I think we, we found that, um time is difficult to get from other people when you know they're they're not so familiar with doing the process we do we do it a lot um so we're kind of good at doing it i suppose and they would rather come to our sessions than run sessions themselves but you know it's something that we want to kind of develop more and, and push more i suppose into the business to work out how we can do that because i think it's in terms of um, in terms of problem framing and design sprints and I suppose for innovation I kind of see it as being part of creative leadership so what we want is to have creative leaders we want people in all areas of the business to have these tools so that they can think creatively about the problems that they're trying to solve um, and, and problem framing is really you know for, for me and I think for which is the is the first kind of key milestone I guess on on getting towards that level of leadership. Uh, some of the questions for both of you, Rick or Joe, um, we have one. Um, what are the three biggest learnings you take away from your experience that uh, you would implement if starting again tomorrow? Um, asked about, I, I, the, the, I, I'm just I've reading this. <laughs> I've alluded to it already, which is I think you don't have to do those three days consecutively. So one of the things that we did is like just to get the right people there and to match people up with their diaries and all the, the nightmare of that is you can have some gaps. You've got to make sure they're not too long, otherwise you lose some momentum, but you you, you can have some gaps and, and, and do that. Um, and the other thing is I kind of what I allude to, make sure if, if you're in a leadership role like me, it's make sure that you have got the right, that you should be in there at all. And, you know, I kind of spoke about that, about whether sometimes actually not let them get on with it, just make sure it's set up okay. Other times, yeah, be in there to make sure you can guide it, either as a decision maker or just within it. And sometimes, yes, as a facilitator, if you want to kind of just show people how you want them to run to kind of teach them a little bit and then let them get on. Those are the kind of uh, three things on that. And I guess that one that I learned is, even at the expense of making more people in there, make sure you include everyone you should. <laughs> okay. Drew, I don't know if you have any others. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, I, I spoke a little bit about it earlier on about, you know, if, if you're facilitating, remember that you are just facilitating. The project doesn't isn't actually yours. So if you get to the point where you've created the problem statement, and then handed it off. Um, don't feel that you need to kind of be pushed into doing anything more about it. It's okay for that to happen. You know, your role as a facilitator can end at that stage because um, it can get, you know, especially if you're being asked to do a lot of them, you can get into a situation where you feel like you're actually in the project when really you aren't. You're just, you're part of kind of helping somebody to, to get on with the project. Um, I suppose the other one that's with it, does it, you're in the discovery phase. Um, so if there's a discussion that needs to be had, um, then let it happen. Um, it doesn't need to be curtailed. You know, you've got you've got the time to spend, and it's better to spend that time now than in two or, th two or three months' time where you find out that somebody really didn't agree with the problem that you'd set up. Um, so yeah, I think you know it's good. I mean, for me, I like it because you find out so much more. You know, on a particular sort of subject area, if you let people talk about it, um, and a lot of the lightning talks really spark kind of different opinions but also you know some real intense conversation bringing up things that are kind of expert level knowledge that that people don't know and really do need to know from the sessions um and then i suppose the, the final one really i suppose is that um problem framing isn't easy it's a hard thing to do um it's a short period of time um and and people find it difficult to start uh, so it's really good to have some examples um, to, to really get people to understand exactly what you want them to do 
Um, and then on the flip side of that as well, um, the first time you do it, you're probably going to think that you didn't do it very well. Um, but as you get on with it, you kind of find your rhythm and you, you know what works. Um, mm-hmm. And once you've kind of got there, then, you know, be confident that, you know, you can rely on the process to get you the thing that it needs at the end. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are probably my three three tips, really. Very good one. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I particularly like the one around discussions. Yeah. I think we're so big advocates of having discussions mm-hmm. in the workshop versus let's do some dot voting and mm-hmm. cut all of the discussions because while well, that makes the workshop a lot easier, also for facilitators, uh, as you said, down the line, you will see that people didn't actually agree, they didn't align, and that's definitely going to want to backfire. Uh, good. Any? No, we can take other questions. Okay, I... let's take other questions. Uh, oh, this, this one is uh, interesting. Um, how has integrating problem framing and design sprint processes, uh, how has integrating problem framing and design sprint processes impacted the culture at which? Have you seen a change in how junior and senior team members interact with each other since implementing this type of uh, decision-making processes? I think it's, we, it's gone hand in hand in product and tech with our, our, our kind of squad culture as well. So I think that that's, it's sort of been part of that process. And also across the entire business has been us you know, grounding a, a, an OKR approach. And we're sort of two years into a three-year, if you like, a program of trying that out and I think it you know most people would say it takes that amount of time to do that so I think it's been seen very much as part of that um in a way it's probably one of the more enjoyable parts that people have quite you know I, we haven't I don't feel we've had much of a problem integrating that and people have enjoyed being part of it it's sort of also been weird because it's coincided with lockdown as well and we've had to use the, you know kind of tools that, that we've, we've talked about like Miro but as I said, we'll probably use that going back when we're doing them in person, because actually, rather than my huge monolithic brown paper thing, it would be actually better if that was in a digital format and um, we won't have to convert it then. There is a bit of an immediacy in the dot voting and things like that, that that sometimes people like. But I think people have gravitated to the, the, the sort of the culture of that right across the board, certainly in product and tech. And I think Drew's done a lot, as he's alluded to, mm-hmm. outside of the, 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 you know, kind of product and tech and so other areas of the business. And again, it's all been very, it, it's kind of, it's an evolution of something they were feeling their way through anyway. So it was, it, it, most of this has felt to us like a bit of an open door and, you know, it, it, having your tools and the you know, kind of that training around it and the framework has given us a sort of something that we can roll out beyond us. Um, the bit that we maybe not got is where we want to with is there are some people who've done some facilitation and Drew mentioned this, we're doing it all the time and we're running these things all the time. There are other bits of the business that are kind of doing it more sporadically. And what we want to do is get them, look, you don't just have to do it for the bit that you're in. You can actually go and help someone else out. So it's just a bit about getting, you know, hours in the saddle, as they say, to kind of get in the rhythm of it. I think that, um, one of the questions that we have um, is related to that because someone is asking how many problem detections can you run simultaneously? How scalable is the process? Um, yeah, and it feels like a lot. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, 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 if you like, it's the setup time and the facilitator and the decision making. So you, that they can't be doing multiple. And mm-hmm. so if you've got some you know, fairly senior stakeholders, you kind of need to can't hit them at two at a time. But if, if you're in different areas, you can run as many as you've got of, of kind of facilitators and those teams. So I think it's, you know, we've certainly run, I would say, I'm thinking, uh, Drew, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've run like at least four or five kind of con- concurrently. I mean, they're not like all start now, finish mm-hmm. now. They've been overlapping. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. yeah certainly. I mean, no, I mean, I guess I was running, I run ran four, um, across probably a month and a half um, and they were sort of sequential but yeah I think at the beginning of although slightly staggered when we started with squads we were running problem framing sessions for OKRs and for working out what the squads were going to do um, pretty much simultaneously so yeah yeah, no, yeah definitely it, it, it's possible um, but yeah it's you know more people doing it would be great <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, I think maybe just to, to add to the sort of the previous question, I guess, about the kind of the dynamic between senior and more sort of senior and junior members of, um, of which, I suppose, and also of the teams. I think one, one thing that I've, I've seen that has been really, really good is that because 
problem framing needs senior stakeholders um, and the people doing that problem framing um, facilitation are UX designers uh, UX, uh, or user researchers. They can be user researchers who, you know, who are a year or two into their career, or designers who are a year or two into their career, or, or people like me who've been doing it for, you know, like, I don't know, like, I've been at Witch for nine years, so I've been working in user UX for about 15. Um, but it really gets, you know, the exposure that you get to doing it, you know, rather than, I guess, the way that things would used to work, where there'd be the senior stakeholders may sit in governance um, and they may see your kind of your design work once a month when they kind of say, yeah, we agree with how you've made that feature look or not. Actually, you're getting exposure to the senior stakeholders right at the beginning um, and you're working with them. And I think the respect that that creates for you for understanding that, you know, they are people who can talk to you and want you to help them um, and the respect that it gets for, for people who are, you know, who are junior can be seen to be doing some really good work. It's a really positive thing for, I guess, for development um, and also for confidence uh, in, in, in the UX um, and, and, you know, and, and for, for just, I suppose, feeling like the business gets what you want it to do and that the user is really thought about um, in, in everything that we do. Back so much creativity, right? Because you have so, this... so it's fair to say that you're bringing basically um, design to onto the table, and yeah, you they, they have to say into decision making. And I think this is how this is answering already a question that said it's been posted here, where someone said that they're coming from a low UX maturity company, and it feels like uh, devs and POs are more invested in business requirements than user experience. And general perception is that design is just a cosmetic addition to things. And I think the answer to you, what you just said, uh, kind of answers that, and how you're actually bringing design at the forefront of the of the I business think it's and an decision making. Yeah. Yeah. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn, both sides. Both sides. Yeah, it does a lot for bonding those teams together as well. I mean, we found in the squads where we do have people from other parts, because not just products and tech people, but content experts and commercial people, it bonds everyone together in those ways. And it doesn't matter about their seniority because that's one of the things that's quite egalitarian, apart from the decision maker, uh, <laughs> across those those pieces there. So I think, you know, we, we've seen a lot of positives from it. And Drew's right on that. Okay. I think oh, we're nearing to an end. Yes. So do we take one more question or? I think we're, no, I think we're good. We're good. So Drew, Rick, thank you so much for, uh, for your time today and for sharing all of these uh, insights. I mean, we're getting many questions about, okay, how does problem framing work? Uh, how does it feel? Uh, what advice do we have? And of course we can give it as consultants, but I think it's much different when it comes from uh, someone that actually does it inside an, a larger organization. So thanks, thanks again for your time and sharing all of these uh, things with, uh, with us. Thank you. And for everyone else, if you want to learn more about problem framing, we still have a couple of spots available in Berlin. So if you're in Berlin, <laughs> we're doing a live like in person, in person uh, yes. problem framing training. last time of this year so <laughs> but still it's a it's a good opportunity for people to learn more about it um and i think my colleague alex also shared some articles around the topic um uh, we're going to uh share the video recording with you and again a couple of resources to help you out if you mm -hmm. have more questions so feel free yeah. to reach out also to Drew and Rick, maybe you have more <laughs> questions, like, <laughs> and they can help out with some advice. Um, and then again, thank you for this great session and for all your amazing insights. And thank you for sticking with us, everyone in the audience. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks, have everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> great to talk. See you. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>